Share your screen, Mr. Sunil, once we are live. So Neil, can you please share the screen? The cover slide, first the cover slide. We can start uh, now. Yes, uh, ma'am. The last class was, was on pre-operative workup that we had uh, okay. last week. After pre-operative workup, I think there was one more class. Uh, Mr. Sunil, what was the last class on? Do you remember? Dr. Tulika must have moderated. Okay. I think it's biometry only as for the schedule how should be the normal aisle par calculation yeah. biometry are we live now yes ma'am we are live okay. good evening and welcome everybody to yet another uh, episode of i focus online so this is episode number 391 on uh, cataract module 5 and i dr pranita sai welcome you all to this interesting session on intraocular lens power intraocular lens power calculation in complex situation I welcome our speaker, Dr. Manpreet Kaur, today for this uh, class. Dr. Manpreet has done her post-graduation and senior residency from the prestigious RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi, and is currently working as associate professor in RP Center itself. She has various credits. Uh, she has uh, she has various uh, awards to her credit, being the achievement award at the APO and the AAO. She has also had the Young Achievers Award at the Iskeris 2022, the IGO Honours Award for Peer Review, and International Heroes Award for AIOS Annual Meeting in 2019, and had various numerous international and national uh, paper and poster presentation for which she has received various awards. She is the editor of two books, both of which pertain to refractive surgery, one being on the current concepts in refractive surgery, another being, being on SMILE. She has over 200 publications and has been a part of various instruction courses at national and international conferences. She's currently the assistant editor of Cataract Session in IJO. She's also the executive editor of the uh, Kerasite magazine, which is the official publication of Iskeris. Dr. Manpreet, we welcome you all to this interesting class on IOL Park calculation in, in complex situations, ma'am. Over to you. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Pranita, for the overwhelming introduction. I'll just share my slide. I think it's a very relevant topic because all of us in some form do practice cataract surgery and aisle power calculation is the backbone of achieving optimal outcomes. So I'll just go to the slideshow. Yeah. So I have no financial disclosures. So the benchmark standard for modern day uh, Cataract surgery has been 55% of cases within 0.5 diopter and 85% of cases within plus minus one diopter. So these were the 2009 standards. Now with evolving IL power calculation formulae and the modern biometry devices, we have 95% cases within plus minus one diopter and 80% within plus minus 0.5 diopter. So the focus has in fact shifted from precise visual acuity to optimal visual quality. However, still there remains a percentage of cases in which you cannot achieve these optimal targets. So these are the complex scenarios which we will cover today. Post-classic PRK, RKIS, post-vitrectomy eyes, post-keratoplasty, pediatric eyes, corneal ectasia, extremes of axial length. So coming first to the post-refractive surgery, IL power calculation. So refractive surgery has really caught on in the subcontinent. And you will get, you we are already getting post RK patients, and you will be getting post classic, post smile patients throughout your career. And it's very, very important to have an optimal IL power calculation in these cases. So, what happens after post myopic PRK or LASIK is that there is central flattening of the anterior corneal surface, 
and the posterior corneal surface is not typically affected, which impacts the keratometry measurements. What happens post radial keratotomy is that there is a central flattening of the anterior as well as the posterior corneal surface with mid peripheral steepening. So, both of these have challenges in keratometry estimation and the challenges do vary from each other as well. So, if you look at the topography maps in post classic, you will see that there is only anterior curvature flattening and the posterior curvature is more or less well maintained. When you look at the post RK cases, you can see in the topography that there is relatively significant anterior flattening as compared to LASIK. And then there is posterior curvature flattening as well. So, how do they induce an error in ILPAR calculation? There is an index error. The standard keratometric index in base of 1.3375 is based on a constant anterior to posterior curvature ratio. So, you see the anterior posterior curvature ratio is altered in both. In post elastic, the anterior is flattened, the posterior is same. So, the ratio changes in RK. Both the anterior and posterior curvature are altered, leading to a change in the standard keratometric index, which no longer holds true. Device error. The keratometry devices typically measure the paracentral region. The central true flat keratometry is not measured. So what you end up taking is a false high K, leading to a falsely low par and a post-op hyperopic surprise. Then comes the formula error. The virgins formulas that use keratometry to estimate the effective lens position no longer hold true as the keratometry itself may be inaccurate. Then the post-operative anterior chamber depth remains the same. However, the flatter keratometry leads to an underestimation of the effective lens part because the K is used to estimate the ELP. So this induces formula error. So which formula to use? So post-refractive ILPAR calculation, I think, is a class in itself. So there are various methods based on the presence or absence of historical data with you. Historical data means the pre-refractive surgery refraction and keratometry measurements. So if you have 100% of the historical data available, there are methods that do not rely on the present K or refraction or AL. They just use the pre-op data. So clinical history method, Pease manus method, corneal bypass methods, they were very useful when we did not have the newer biometry devices and the newer formulae. Then there are methods that use a combination of historical data and preoperative keratometry. So both pre-op and post-op K, if both are available, then Aramberry double K, Seed Spezer method, Barrett true K can be used. If you have the magnitude of refractive correction data available with you, then you can correct that keratometric index of 1.3375. You, you can adjust it as per the magnitude of refractive correction. So you have adjusted refractive index methods, adjusted corneal PAR methods in which you get an adjusted K, adjusted IL PAR in which you use the magnitude of refractive correction to calculate a corrected IL PAR. So these are complex formulas. We will not go into their details, but mathematical formulas that are available if you wish to use. Then in case you have no historical data, which is what is commonly the case, you just have the patient coming in with a history of myopic classic, PRK or RK done some years back and no records, no records at all. So you can have refraction-based method, contact lens method, Eangelis, McCool's method, use of intraoperative aberrometry in which either the pre-op pre-cataract surgery or intra-op cataract surgery refraction is used to calculate the IL part. Then post-operative keratometry from devices that measure anterior corneal curvature only. So various corrections are available to calculate a corrected K based only on the current keratometry after refractive surgery. Then there are devices that measure both the anterior and posterior corneal curvature and take into account the changes that have taken into uh, come after refractive surgery. So the swept source OCT, OCT formula, Potwin Shama's Hill formula, these are commonly used. Then ray tracing methods using the true corneal power, the total corneal power, equivalent K readings available on sheen plug topography. Then softwares based on ray tracing methods such as Oculex, Spaco Optics, etc. A lot of methods are available. 
So coming to the conundrum of which one to use when you have these 50, 60 formulas and methods available. So using pre-elastic K and surgically induced refractive change, 37 to 44% cases are within 0.5 diopter of target refraction. So we would like more uh, accuracy than these methods. So clinical history, fees managed and corneal bypass method, they come under this head. So if you use only the change in manifest refraction, 57 to 67% fall within 0.5 diopter of target refraction. So Barrett True K, Maskets, Modified Maskets Formula, Adjusted Effective Refractive Power or Adjusted Atlas Keratometry, these fall under this category. If you have no previous data, then the earlier formulas, 58 to 60% were within 0.5 diopter of target. Hagee's L, which all of us must have used at one point or the other, Bangkok Meloni and Shama's PL. The recent formulas, which uh, do not rely on previous data, give 60 to 75% 5 of cases within 0.5 diopter of target refractive error. These include the Barrett True K formula, which is also our formula of choice whenever I am doing cataract surgery in a post refractive case. Ray tracing formula using True K or conventional keratometry, OCT based formulas, use of total K in Hague's Barrett Universal or EVO formula and use of intraoperative aberrometry. Then American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, ASCRS online calculator has simplified life for all of us. So currently there is a 4.9 version available on site, which has three modules. Whether you have a previous myopic classic PRK, hyperopic classic PRK or previous RK. So 14 Manpreet, methods. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah, sure, sure. I am Dr. Mukesh actually. I'm sorry I uh, could connect a little late because of some uh, connectivity issue. So can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. So here uh, we all are using nowadays Barrett Rook in most cases because we don't uh, have the previous data available generally. So in Barrett Rook, like uh, you uh, use keratometry from which source? Like suppose you have got IOL master also available and uh, also the topographer. So we are relying on IL Master 700 that has given us quite accurate results. In fact, we also do implant premium IELs in post classic cases, which requires an enhanced predictability. And IL Master 700 has worked very well. However, it's always useful to take keratometry on at least two devices to cross check because these cases can end up in surprises more so than any normal case. So correct. Actually, uh, whatever experience we have nowadays, we are banking upon the keratometry from uh, corneal topograph, let's say pentacam or opscan, because what we feel that uh, whenever we use keratometry from IOL master, the results are not that accurate. So if we feed in, what we do is we feed in uh, axial length from IOL master into the formula given into the pentacam. And then we calculate. So uh, those uh, uh, calculations give us almost accurate results. The this fallacy with that accurate. is that pentacam keratometry cannot be used directly in the IL master formulae because they are based on using simulated keratometries. So except for EKR, there is no keratometry value that you directly put in in the conventional IL par calculation formula. So that also has to be taken into account. EKR is made so that it's already adjusted, it can be used directly. Otherwise, I would not advocate taking Pentacam TCP, TCRP, TNP directly in the conventional IL Park formulae using the optical biometry methods. So moving on. Yeah, so the corrected keratometry obtained by the methods uh, in the ASCRS online calculator can be used in five IL Park formulae, namely the double K holiday one, Shamas PL, Hegezel, OCT-based formula and Barrett True K. The masket and modified masket methods directly provide the corrected IL for a part, which are already incorporated in the ASCRS website. So you get the maximum, minimum and average IL par using all the methods in addition to the par calculated by these individual methods. So these are just the methods available in the ASCRS online calculator. So based on the change in magnitude of refraction, you have the adjusted effect effective refractive part, the adjusted atlas, the adjusted atlas ring values, masket, modified masket, adjusted ACCP or Barrett True K. 
so these are the il formulas which are used with these form uh, these corrective uh, keratometry devices double q holiday shamas double q holiday 1 Uh, with adjusted accp you get double q holiday one and with barrett truke of course barrett truke mask it and modified mask it as i told in my previous slide they are directly going to give you the corrected il par then methods using no prior data you have bangkok meloni method shamas higgisel galili potwin hill pentacam oct and barrett truke no history so which formula to choose so if you are measuring the posterior corneal curvature as well you have the options of barrett true uh, total k oct based formula hagis tk ray tracing formula evo potwin hill if posterior curvature is not measured so these are in order of preference barrett true k history method if change in refractive error is known barrett true k no history or intraop aberrometry if available hagis l ray tracing and shamas pl so these formula need no history and of course online calculators post refractive eye calculator at ascrs website barrett truke at apscrs and ascrs website have simplified life for all of us so this is just a case example so we'll be going with case example after i cover each section so that you gain a practical understanding of what to do how to calculate the part so this patient underwent myopic lasik 10 years ago was scheduled for a right eye cataract surgery Pre-lasik refractive error was minus seven diopter in both eyes. Pre-op keratometry was not known. So this is the axial length, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, white to white, K1, K2 on IL master seven hundred. Total K1, K2, TK1, TK2, taking into account the posterior corneal curvature on IL master seven hundred. So when you feed this value in the Ascaris calculator, you can see you come up with whatever data you have. Since we did not have any prior data. so these are the formulas that will give you the par so you get the average il par of all available formulas minimum as well as maximum so maximum is 13.54 and barrett true k no history which uh, happens to be my formula of choice as well is 13.47 so we aim for a slight myopia and a 14 diopter iol was put post operative uncorrected distance visual acuity was 66 in this case so for post radial keratotomy cases best results are achieved with barrett true k history method if pre op refraction is known if no history is available barrett true k and unadjusted hagis are most accurate so we use both hagis and barrett true k if available and the basic rule of thumb is to take the flattest k and the highest il par so in this case choose the flattest k high, highest il par this is the barrett true k giving 7.5 minus 0.33 diopter refractive target so in another case the hagis gave 14.5 barrett is giving around 17 we are using the total keratometry values so again if the il pars differ in two biometry uh, il par formula on the same device use the higher il par so we implanted 17 diopter you what you don't want is a post op hyperopia that is what you wish to avoid in all these cases so i'll just also briefly cover the type of il because with accurate il par calculation the type of il also assumes importance in these cases so an aspheric monofocal il is the best if you are undergoing a myopic lasik prk that induces positive spherical aberration so choose an il with negative spherical aberration for hyperopic lasik prk it induces negative spherical aberrations so choose a zero spherical aberration il rather than a il with negative spherical aberration which will compound the aberrations toric il should only be done if there is regular astigmatism in central 3 mm repeatable magnitude and axis of astigmatism on at least two different devices do not rely on one device only in these cases and a favorable corneal aberration profile post lasik cases usually they don't have any issue with toric post rk be careful multifocal edof in post rk cases for me it's a no for post lasik prk cases with minimal higher order aberrations and regular corneal surface you can go ahead just remember these patients underwent lasik prk in the first case because they wished for spectacle independence they are very high demanding patients even after multifocal edof they would want spectacle independence which in this case you cannot really guarantee so be careful don't burn your hands chair time beforehand will save you and the patient a lot of headache afterwards so ray tracing aberrometry of course is a useful tool while planning pre miles after refractive surgery 
you should have a good higher order aberration profile and good model modulation transfer function and strain ratio in case you are veering away from the conventional monofocal IOs. Whenever you are in doubt, go ahead with only a monofocal IOL. So in this case, a toric IOL was planned and Hage's parrot true formula is preferred. So another case, 39-year-old male, history of LASIK, both eyes 16 years ago, was planned for right eye FACO with premium mile. The total keratometry was 0.14 diopter, the delta TK, and no significant higher order aberration on ray trace aberrometry. So we went ahead and planned a premium mile. Just to summarize in the post-refractive surgery cases, so under-promise and over-deliver, accurate keratometry and ELP are where the challenge lies. So topographers that measure both the anterior and posterior corneal curvature will help. IL power calculation use the newer, newer formula. Barrett helps a lot. And online calculators have been a boon for all of us. They are free of cost and you can compare various formulas and choose the best possible IL. Choice of IL, aspheric monofocal IELs, premium IELs only if there's a regular corneal surface and minimal higher order aberration and regular astigmatism. Interop consideration, of course, are not the purpose of this class. Incision management in RK is challenging. Post-operatively, you will have delayed visual recovery and there is a tendency for hyperopic shift, especially in post-RK, so counsel well. Coming to the second section, IL power calculation in corneal ectasias. So keratoconus and cataract, you have challenges in axial length, keratometry, effective lens position, and choosing the right IL power formula. So axial elongation and myopia is seen in keratoconus. In fact, all of us think that ectasia keratometry is going to be the challenge in accurate calculation. What we have found is that there's a stronger correlation of final spherical equivalent with axial length rather than pre-op K readings in keratoconus. So do not underestimate the importance of getting an accurate axial length. Ultrasonic is often inaccurate because there is a decentered apex in keratoconus. The visual axis estimation is uncertain and challenging. Optical biometry is preferred as the visual axis determination is more accurate. Keratometry. There is an altered anterior to posterior corneal curvature ratio. Again, the standard keratometric index of 1.3375 on which all the SIMK assumptions are made is erroneous. Keratometers are inaccurate as there is asymmetry of visual curvature, corneal curvature, visual axis and the corneal apex do not coincide. So this is the instrument error. Irregular tear film is going to limit your repeatability of corneal curvature measurements and formula error as inaccurate ELP estimation, steep corneas with higher axial length have a deep anterior chamber depth and it's very, very difficult to accurately predict the effective lens position. So when do you perform biometry is also important in these cases because there may be contact lens dependent and the corneal warpage is going to alter your K. For soft contact lenses, wait at least one week off contact lens. For RGP hybrid and toric, wait two weeks. Scleral lens, lenses that do not touch the cornea, two to three days is often enough. So manual and automated keratopetry have very low reliability. In advanced keratoconus cases, the preferred modalities should be optical biometry or a corneal tomography. Again, the true net power and equivalent K uh, readings may be used. True net power measures the refractive power of the anterior and posterior cornea, assigning to each of them specific refractive indices. And equivalent K readings, both anterior and posterior corneal power is taken into account. As I said earlier, EKR values you can directly enter into your IL master or any other IL power calculation method. True net power and TCRP you cannot enter. Either you alter the formula or take into account the errors by this. Then this is just an example of the equivalent K reading. 4.5 mm zone has found to be most accurate in the studies. And then you also have to see if you're calculating the EKR values ringed on, centered on the vertex or on the pupil. You have to take the pupil centric value because the vertex may be inferiorly displaced and the apex and the pupil will, may not coincide. As you can see, the keratometry is not going to be the same if you take the EKR centered on pupil or on the vertex. So be careful while using Pentacam EKR readings in a case of ectasia. So this is an example. You can also alter the zone, actual zone from which you want to take the keratometry. So choose the central zone and then you can take the K1 and K2. So which uh, K to use in mild or moderate keratoconus, K less than 48 or 48 to 55, use the actual keratometry. 60% of cases with mild keratoconus and 41.9% with moderate keratoconus will be within one diopters. 
for advanced keratoconus, more than 55 diopters, nothing works as well. Standard K of 43.5 diopter has been advocated. So all formulas result in post-operative hyperopia. So your target should be myopia. The more advanced the keratoconus, more the target myopia. So for less than 47 diopter, holiday 2 with double K adjustment, Hopper Q, SRK2 and SRKT have been found to be good enough. Target a myopia of minus 1 diopters. 47 to 50 diopters, studies have said SRKT to be the most accurate and target a myopia of minus 1.5 diopter. More than 50 diopter, all formulas are unpredictable, large post-operative hyperopia, use SRKT, now, the newer formulas, SCAN, EVO, Barrett Universal 2, of course, are also coming up in various studies. They have very predictable results. Avoid using actual K. Standard K may be better in advanced keratoconus and aim for a target myopia of minus 1.8 to 2 diopters. So, this is just a study comparing the five ILPAR calculation formula, SRKT, Barrett, Hages, Hopper, Q, and Holiday 1 in keratoconus. What they found was that SRKT was the most accurate, 61.9% of stage 1 within prediction error of 0.5 diopter, 30.7% of stage 2, and stage 3, as you can see in all the formulas, fared poorly. Whatever method you use, 14.29% with SRKT had the prediction error of 0.5. This is just a case example of a 35-year-old female with both high advanced keratoconus with intumescent cataract. Stable, no progression. So as you can see, the keratometry values are quite steep. So optical biometry, we were unable to capture because it was a white cataract. Axilent immersion A scan was done. So this also is going to be a challenge. You may not be able to capture an optical biometry. Keratometry, the pentacam, pentacam EKR values were taken. And right eye, minus one diopter expand series IL was put with a target myopia of minus 1.36 diopters, post-operative uncollected visual acuity 624 parts with a refraction of plus 3.5 and minus four diopter cell. The patient was also advised contact lens in the post-op period. So advanced keratoconus, we do not really prefer going for a toric IL. So monofocal IELs are the IL of choice. Toric IELs in formic prostate. Keratoconus, careful patient selection, non-progressive keratoconus, realistic expectations. You will be reducing the magnitude of cylinder, not eliminating it. So rather than a refractive procedure, a toric chyle is going to be a therapeutic correction. It will reduce the magnitude of cylinder. If you can make the patient understand this and it's a stable formipraste, low K, repeatable axis magnitude patient, you can go for toric chyle. Explain the need for post-op visual rehabilitation as well. So this is a second case example in both high keratoconus with dense PSC, stable, no progression in 19 year, 41 and 47K, early form of trusty keratoconus that has been stable since the last five, six years. So a case of VKC as well earlier, now stable. So we put in a T9 IOL in both highs. So it reduced the magnitude of cylinder in the left eye. In the right eye, it almost took care of the entire cylinder. Still, there was 0.75 residual left. So a good uncorrected distance visual acuity, very useful for a young patient because it reduces the reliance on spectacles with this high cylinder, 6.15 and 5.35 delta DK. So premium eyes and keratoconus, enhanced monofocal, extended range of vision, multifocus are a strict no. They will induce further aberrations in an aberrated keratoconic cornea. So just to summarize the IL power in keratoconus, axial length is longer than usual, prefer optical biometry. Keratometry, overestimation of K with the topographers, so choose the flattest K. For mild to moderate keratoconus, use your topographers. For advanced keratoconus, go for standard K. I'll par post-op hyperopia is expected, so target myopia, more with increasing severity of keratoconus. Formulas, SRKT, cane keratoconus, Barrett Universal 2. I'll type monofocal, toric only in mild to moderate stable disease, no multifocals. Document stability of disease, counsel well, and you will need post-operative visual rehabilitation. There is no one-size-fits-all, so customize as per your case. So now we come to post-keratoplasty cataract. So post-keratoplasty and pre-keratoplasty as well. So full thickness and anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Simultaneous procedures, PK or LK with cataract surgery, your challenge will be which keratometry to use. 
standard keratometry of 43.5 diopter is used often some prefer using a contralateral keratometry the only issue is you are going to transplant a cornea so it is not going to match the curvature of the fellow eye so the outcomes are not really very predictable with either of the methods and mean k value derived from the surgeon's past keratoplasty is also has been used however again wound healing is an unpredictable process will vary from case to case from uh, the pathology if it's a keratoconus cornea you're doing a, a full thickness pk4 or is it a dystrophy or is it an adherent leukoma that will vary your predicted k as well any of the newer generation ilpar calculation formula is used and there is a tendency for post op hyperopia to aim for myopia so i prefer to use standard keratometry of 43.5 diopters then sequential cataract surgery after pk or lk complete suture removal and stabilization of refractive error prior to cataract surgery is preferred axial length optical biometry of course keratometry computerized tomography topography for estimation of the central corneal part as in post rk cases post classic cases you do not want a simulated k you would rather want a central keratometry so use your sheen plug imaging or use your eye master 700s to get accurate central corneal part there is a tendency for myopic shift after cataract surgery in post dal cases that has been observed increased predict Predictability with the newer generation formula K and Evo, Hoffer QST, SRKT, endothelial keratoplasty, DSEC, DMEC triple, or cataract surgery performed prior to EK. So you have to remember that there is going to be a posterior corneal steepening and regression of corneal edema after endothelial keratoplasty. So there is going to be a hyperopic shift of around plus 1.5 diopter in DSEC, around 0.32 diopter in DMEC. so you have to take the il par uh, accordingly so target a myopia of 1.5 diopter for dsec and 0.32 diopter or 0.5 diopter in dmec comparable refractive outcomes are seen with the newer generation il par formula so any of the newer versions formulas or ai based ray tracing based formulas can be used barrett evo hages copper q holiday kn srkt So just a case example: a 55-year-old female patient with pk corneal decompensation planned for DMEC. Best spectacle corrected visual acuity 618 in the left eye. So was planned for a left eye DMEC. So axial length is comparable. Keratometry we could not uh, obtain accurate Myers on VKG or K. So pentacam readings we could obtain 45 and 46.8 diopter. So IL par calculation was performed using the pentacam sim k values and a target myopia of 0.75 diopter minus 0.75 diopter a 20.5 diopter single piece aspheric acrylic IL was implanted in the back with a post operative visual acuity at 3 months of 69 in so coming to posterior segment pathology again this is going to be a major chunk when you are doing cataracts regularly you will get patients with operated rd oil in situ or erms etc so silicon oil fills the major challenges accurate axial length estimation so we know the velocity of sound in silicon oil is 987 uh, meter per second and in, in vitreous is 1532 so the ultrasound axial length is fallaciously high in the presence of silicon oil in situ so how do you calculate the corrected al is going to be your major challenge to so change the sound of speed in vitreous cavity to 987 meter per second in the ultrasound machine you can do that oil filled mode okay hofer et al said that measure the axial length at 1000 meter per second and use this um, equation true axial length is axial length measure at the 1000 meter per second into 1139 upon 1000 then there are various conversion factors one is that corrected al you just measure the al at 1532 meter per second and multiply by 0.71 which we have used in our residency days earlier a more accurate version would be to calculate the length of the anterior chamber lens thickness plus 0.64 into the vitreous cavity length so you are correcting this corrective factor for only the vitreous cavity length which is filled with oil then add the lengths of anterior chamber lens thickness and vitreous cavity each calculated separately based on the different velocities of sound in them more tedious then length of ac plus lens plus vitreous length into 0.634 plus retro silicon space because they say that retro silicon space is the gap between the premacular area and the oil because complete oil film may not be there in all cases 
and the velocity of sound in this retro silicon space is equal to that of in normal vitreous and the rest will have to be corrected for oil fill so this formula also has been described then intraoperative methods measure al after sor using ultrasonic methods intraop opaque refraction aberrometry then factors of r into 2.01 where r is the spherical equivalent calculated corrected for a vertex distance of 50 cm or automated intraop refraction where the il path predicted using a scan is multiplied by 0.94 minus 2.6 then that is the actual il path so various intraop methods have been described then fellow i axial length has limited utility in an isometropy or one eyed patients is useful if you have prior history before the development of pathology as well pre vitrectomy al limited use in cases with macula of rd or surgical intervention like in circlage buckel optical biometers i master and lens star have a 10 times increased accuracy than the other methods so if you can achieve an accurate optical biometry in a silicon oil filled mode that is going to give you unmatched accuracy so a case example of a 55 year old patient who had undergone previous vitreo retinal surgery with oil injection in right eye was planned for simultaneous cataract surgery with sor so a scan was done with a preset sound speed of 1532 meter per second optical biometry was not possible the cataract was very dense and the axial length in fellow i was 22.3 we did not know if pre op it was comparable or not on ultrasonic biometry axial length came out to be 34.27 this was the acd lens thickness and vitreous cavity length respectively so the corrected axial length was calculated as per this formula length of anterior chamber lens thickness and 0.64 into vitreous cavity length so we came out with a corrected axial length of 24.53 then this axial length was put in the barrett universal formula and an 18.5 that per eye was implanted post operatively the uncorrected vision was 618 acceptance of minus 0.75 then we did an optical biometry after oil removal and cataract removal when al could be assessed and we found that using optical biometry it came out to be 24.8 so we came close enough if you could see so this was accurate so we do prefer this method nowadays in cases in which we cannot achieve an accurate optical biometry so coming to retinal detachment use a adjusted optical biometry if you can do that in macula of rds the operator can manually select the posterior take peak in cases with double peak to obtain accurate al the anterior one is going to be the retina multiple posterior peaks the peak giving al values for corresponding to the al measured with a scan or the contralateral eye axial length measured using optical biometry device may be selected correlate the axial length always with the fellow eye and known refraction the status of any anisometropy amblyopia pre operatively because one eye may be longer and fellow eye al may be used if no significant difference in refractive error of both eyes before rd combine vector ab scan contact method in cases with detached macula so a 2d b scan image guides the overlying vector a scan to directly measure to the fovea I'll par aim for post op hyperopia of approximately 0.5 diopters. So this is in contrast with whatever we have been doing earlier in post RD in post posterior segment pathologies. Generally, you get a post op induced myopia. So you have to aim for slight hyperopia. So in RRD eyes, macula attached or not attached is going to change your management. So you can use an A scan. optical biometry preferred if macula attached if it is detached and optical biometry scan with acceptable signal to noise ratio is uh, acquired then nothing uh, better than that you can use uh, if it's comparable to the fellow eye optical biometry then use this scan only confirm with ipsilateral a scan if there is significant difference with the fellow eye so choose the posterior peak user adjusted optical biometry when a double peak is seen In multiple posterior peaks also choose the posterior peak based on the ipsilateral a scan or contralateral optical biometry al combined vector ab scan as i told in the previous slide or immersion layer comparable to the other eye if you cannot acquire an optical biometry a scan is acquired actually in comparable to other eye use the immersion or contact a scan not comparable to the other eye use a combined vector ab scan or the other eye axial length okay so just a case example a 48 year old year old male patient with macula of rd in the right eye was planned for combined cataract surgery with partial retinal vitrectomy axial length in right eye using optical biometry was 15.82 
and OCT showed the detached retina displaced anteriorly. Axial length in fellow eye was 25.47. So contact A scan showed a single uh, low amplitude spike anterior to the retinal spike. So we took this as the retinal spike and this we ignored. So this was 15 uh, or 16 mm and this was the correct 25 mm approximately. So you can see in this case, the optical biometry was erroneous. So as the A-scan obtained on, uh, A-scan obtained axial length was comparable to that of the fellow eye, ILPAR was calculated using Barrett Universal 2 with axial length value of 25.5. Post-operatively, UCV at three months was 612 and a minus 0 0.5 diopter residual was remaining. Scleral buckling. So what does buckling do? It changes the shape of the globe to spherical to prolate. Axial length increases by 0 0.57 to 0 0.98. ACD decreases. Corneal curvature increases. Refractive status, there is a myopic shift of minus 1.04 to minus 2.93, which stabilizes by three months. So what do you do? For ILPAR calculation, wait for the biometric parameters to stabilize before planning a cataract surgery at least six to nine months because a lot of these changes are going to regress. If you have to do simultaneous cataract surgery with scleral buckling, account for post-op induced myopia. So aim for a one to two diopter hyperopia, not myopia as in all the other cases we learn. In post uh, posterior segment pathologies, post scleral buckling, you have to aim for hyperopia. So just to summarize the ILPAR calculation in posterior segment pathologies, axial length estimation is going to be your major challenge. So allow stabilization of biometry after buckling and circlage for at least six to nine months. Silicon oil filled eyes, high proportion of residual myopic or hyperopic error. SSOCT based biometers useful in present of RD, ERM, macular edema, introp aberrometry for on table power after SOR and FACO. Newer generation ILPA formulae give fairly accurate outcomes and sequential surgeries are always going to be better than simultaneous. However, you may not always have a choice. I'll just briefly cover pediatric eyes. So we know that there is a process of emetropization after birth and axial length grows, keratometries decrease and the crystalline lens power also decreases. So you have to take this into account while planning an ILPA. So Based on unilateral or bilateral cataracts, there are a lot of factors which affect the selection of IL part. So these are just the various um, protocols given for the target under correction when you're implanting in different age groups. So less than one year, a lot of people do not prefer to implant lens, especially if it's a bilateral surgery. Even my choice would be not to implant an IL because of the unpredictability of we at all have said plus 10 diopter or no IL in less than three months, three to six months plus eight diopter less than one year plus seven. Dahan said 20% under correction for less than one year. West have not described their protocols for less than one year. Off note, if it's a unilateral cataract, you have to implant a lens if you can. Otherwise, post-op rehabilitation is very challenging and you lose the eye to amblyopia as it is. At one year, so these are the protocols, the amount of undercorrection decreases with increasing age. So various protocols and algorithms have been described, which you can see various other factors come into play, unilaterality, bilaterality, any other pathology in the eye, what's the white to white, what's the anterior chamber depth. Will the parents be able to use contact lens? If you give contact lens, will they be able to use glasses? What's the mental status of the child? Will he be using glasses? Is nystagmus present or not? So this is a different topic in itself. Not that simple. I'll par calculation in pediatric eyes, but this is a general outline. In extremes of axial length, so the newer generation formula do not pose as much of a problem. So I'll just give a brief outline. In short axial length of less than 22 mm, anterior chamber depth, can, is measured or not? If no, use Hopper Q. If yes, axial length less than 20 mm, use Kane, Evo, Hagis, Holiday 2, and Hopper Q. This is the order of the formulas to be used based on various studies. Kane and Evo 2 fare the best. If axial length is more than 20 mm, use conventional formulas such as Hagis to perform good, Hopper Q and Holiday rate after Hagis. Newer formula Kane, Hill, RBF, Evo 2 perform quite predictably. In long guys, more than 26 mm, if axial length is less than 30 mm, 26 to 30 mm, Barrett Universal 2, Hill, RBF, Olsen perform well, target a 0.5 diopter myopia. 
Hades and SRKT target a 0.5 to 1 diopter myopia. If axial length is more than 30 mm, so these are the high myopes. Barrett Universal 2 performs better than Hill RBF2 or Olsen. Hagis with optimized constant for plus or minus lens. And Hagis and Holiday 1, Bangkok Meloni target a mild myopia of 0.5 diopter. If you're using just Hagis, target 1 to 2 diopter of myopia. So just to summarize, we have evolved from early theoretical formulas to regression formula, virgins, aberrometry, and artificial intelligence-based formula. So these virgins, aberrometry, and artificial intelligence-based formula are the modern-day formulas, which have better predictability of effective lens position and enhanced post-operative refractive predictive accuracy. Early theoretical formulas, of course, are of historical interest. SRK1, SRK2, limited utility in pediatric cases, ectasia or post-keratoplasty, not commonly used now. So in any of the challenging cases, these newer formulas perform well. What you have to understand is what is the major challenge in that case? Like for post-refractive surgery, the keratometry is the challenge. Oil filled eyes, axial length is the challenge. And make corrective factors or predictive errors for that um, error that is induced by that particular pathology. And then when you have corrected the ALRK, you can use any of the newer formulas to achieve fairly predictable outcomes. So we have just come out with a book. This is my third book on IL path calculation made easy, which will give you all the newer formulas. We'll trace the history of all the formulas and IL path calculation in complex cases. Each and every scenario is covered. So do go through that if you are a regular PECO surgeon. Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am. That was a wonderful class and it has definitely taken me back to my junior residency days where you would have been taking these all these classes so uh, with so much of enthusiasm. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, we have a few uh, postgraduate students who have uh, connected with us today and I'm sure they are eager to ask a lot of questions. So as uh, we can see, I have uh, Dr. Arun Mehta, who's a third year postgraduate at Guru Nanak Eye Center. And I also have Dr. Kaveri Birla, who's a first year postgraduate at Lady Harding Medical College. And I have Dr. we have Dr. Tulika and Dr. Ishita, who are DNB fellows at Center for Sight Eye Hospital, New Delhi. So I welcome all four of you to this class. And uh, Dr. Arun, do you have any questions to ask to Dr. Manfred? I think... This is the right opportunity that you have to connect with her and you can ask her all that you want. You can unmute yourself first. Ma'am, it was a bouncer like, but I will review. Um, my question is what will we do in case of a refractive surprise if we encounter? A refractive surprise, the first is not to jump for an IL exchange. First, find out the cause, okay? So you okay. have to repeat the biometry at that time. You have to it's see normal. that the anterior segment is normal. If it's a corneal edema, edematous case, and you have a 612 vision, minus 1 is coming on AR, or minus 3.5 cell is coming on AR, you don't jump, especially I've seen in a lot of cases which you implant a toric aisle, day 1, AR says minus 3.5. And the resident may be like, we have to exchange the aisle. It has rotated or something has happened. Do not mm -hmm. jump on day one to conclusions. So get a pre -op, get the pre-op biometry out. Repeat the biometry. Wrong. See if they are telling or not. So that will tell you if it's a gross aisle par error in which you have mistakenly, inadvertently implanted a wrong aisle or something else is the cause. Okay, then wait for stabilization. Even if it is a toric aisle and you have to re-rotate, wait at least one week. Then do a post-op good refraction. See what is the residual refractive error. And based on that, you can take a decision to exchange to wait and do a surface enhancement or any other procedure or a piggyback, which will vary from mm -hmm. case to case. Now you are talking about refractive surprise in which exact case will determine the exact answer. Yeah. Ma'am, is there any choice of formula also which we will uh, for take refractive into surprise? Yes, ma'am. For what? For pseudophagic, uh, You can use any of the newer generation formulas. Like if you have to calculate a, for a piggyback aisle after a refractive surprise, that has specific formulas. If you have to rotate a toric aisle, 
that has like there are online software astigmatic fix at uh, dot com at all in which you enter the values and get the magnitude of rotation or ray tracing yes, aberrometry in which you get how much of rotation is going to correct how much of your residual refractive error if you need to change the lens etc so any of the yes, newer generation formula will give you accurate results and i don't if you're talking about i think routine eyewells that you're talking about monofocal routine eyewells then mm -hmm. based on whatever the patient's axial length is you can choose the best formula as such barrett universal works well in all the eyes but you can look at the axial length if it is the shorter long you can choose the eye formulas according to that okay routine yes ma'am yes, ma so dr kaveri hi uh, good evening ma'am good evening ma Uh, Ma'am, I had a question. You mentioned about the AI-based formulas. Ma'am, what are the predictive outcomes between the AI-based formulas and the conventional uh, Virgin's formulas? So, as of now, the newer generation formulas, like Barrett Universal to the newer Virgin's formulas, they are comparable to AI-based formula in terms of outcomes. So, it's still evolving. Artificial intelligence technology. and hopefully we will be able to customize uh, power based on each individual patient as of now are they way superior to the conventional formula no that's not the case they are still hill rbf 3.0 we have we started with the earlier versions 2.0 then now we have 3.0 so ai you have to understand that what you get out is what you feed in so what we are using right now in artificial intelligence based formula is lot lot of statistics rather than true deep learning through artificial intelligence so they are predictive models based on a lot of data that we feed in so true ai will come when it will incorporate deep learning and automatically take into account changes as well and then predict an ai formula as long as we are just using mathematical models and stats ai is not going to go that far ahead of virgin's formulas and um, another question what is the uh, limiting factor affecting the predictability of the iol power calculation so now with the newer generation biometric devices are excellent estimation are keratometry we have achieved quite good predictability levels what still remains the holy grail of file power calculation is effective lens power calculation uh, lens position calculation so elp prediction is still where we are not 100% sure where the lens is going to end, uh, set in the bag and which exact plane so that is what leads to variability that is why even in absolutely clean cases you do not say that we have 100% within plus minus 0.5 even if you take all your normal cases you will still have variability and that's because of the effective lens position which is yet to be that accurate thank you ma'am thank you ma'am just one question i had uh, ma'am we were discussing about the ekr values you said that uh, the studies are reporting that 4.5 mm is the uh, is the point where we should take in the uh, value for calculating yeah yeah because only in ectasia uh, there were studies for it yeah okay so usually in post refractive uh, cases what is your preferred uh, zone for the ekr value is it 4.5 or do you take 3 2.5 post uh, refractive surgery would be normal 3 and actually i do not prefer using the pentacam values only for post refractive because our il master 700 and spectro society gives very very accurate result if we use pentacam we have used simk but uh, when pentacam is described for post refractive they say its advantage is in the tcrp tnp of uh, those cannot be directly incorporated in the conventional formula that's the problem they say that simk is not going to give you that much of an advantage over the conventional values yeah so in case you use it then you use the 3 mm zone for post yes 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 and one more thing ma'am that we were discussing about toric ioles in uh, post refractive cases like post lasik cases so would you like to do uh, topography in all these cases before you're going for a toric ioles yes yes in all these cases because we would post like post lasik to... usually uh, you do not have an issue with toricity post rk is where the issue is to implant or not to implant because you'll almost always be getting a toric ioles only So to put the toric ioles to not is where the challenge lies, I think. 
So basically, we would also like to see if the uh, the in cases of LASIK whether the ablation is centered or not, and the yes. ST pattern that we are getting is in a regular pattern or not. Yes. Then only yes. we will go ahead for a toric iron. Yes. So I think we have had a really engrossing uh, lecture on such a complex topic of complex IL power calculation. So, ma'am, we would like to thank you so much for that uh, exhaustive lecture that we had, and I hope the residents have learned something. You yes, want to ask any more questions? Uh, I Mr. think Sir. each of these topics deserves a separate class in itself. It is just a brief overview in this uh, class, but Definitely. yeah. Definitely, ma'am, but you have covered yes. them really well. And at the end of the lecture, I would also like to invite all the residents for the Physical Eye Focus 2024 that is to be conducted in Hyderabad in the month of June from 9 to 16. We are going to have didactic sessions in uh, the AIG Hospital Auditorium in Hyderabad with hands-on session on various courses as well. And registrations are limited and they are limited to only 300 candidates. So you may register as soon as possible if you are interested. And I think Dr. Santosh has been doing a great work organizing these classes and we must really thank him for organizing these interesting lectures that are benefiting so many benefiting so many postgraduates. Ma'am, thank you so much for being there and thank, thank you.